Woods. And demands of people, and so we have May on the. Uh, well, I don't know if we you have her on the right channel or not. May say something. May right May is on the right channel. I have the left channel. That has no political significance whatsoever. I assure you, but some people may have their stereo reversed, in which case some homes will have you on the left and I'll be on the right. But I'm sure that, I'm sure, don't attach any meaning to that. Okay, when the show goes, we'll scramble the... Those of you with monaural radios are getting the really objective portion of the show. <laughs> um, dialogue, what is dialogue conspiracy? I should ask, I should ask you that, because I know you're going to ask me to explain it, and I'm going no, to refuse. Yeah, you explain it. You did it so well. Dialogue conspiracy... It's a fictional program. <laughs> no, it's purely, yeah, purely non-fiction program dealing with uh, <laughs> politics and the uh, news of the day. May started her research following the John Kennedy assassination uh, almost a decade ago and has become involved in Martin Luther King assassination as far as the study of that and the Bobby Kennedy assassination and has been following the events which she feels are tied into the uh, causes behind those assassinations and the uh, what appear to be lies and contradictions that are in the news and are in the uh, events surrounding the assassinations and for that reason the show is called dialogue conspiracy because it seems to um, to be a pattern of conspiracies and cover-ups and other things involved in these uh, events and everyday events so today's show will be another another look at what's in the news and how the news of today ties into the past and how it may influence the future. I guess the news of this week, we should uh, discuss a little bit the Republican convention uh, in terms of conspiracy. Uh, and my favorite subject in terms of conspiracy, Nixon and Agnew, because I feel that Richard Nixon is a selected person, a front man who's packaged to the American people by a handful of individuals and that he's been the front man since 1945 when he was selected to run in Congress against Voorhees. He's been the front man for some very wealthy munitions people, aerospace industries, bankers, and oil industry, and uh, um, he represents the wishes of those people. Well, how do, you, how do you find a politician that isn't representing somebody in these days where it... Uh well, it takes so much to get elected. Well, I think that... that takes a lot of money to get elected. If you study American history, the way the Constitution was made up of the electoral processes in the past, um, maybe the Republican Party, say, represented the very wealthy and the interests of the very wealthy. And the man who was to get the nomination or the election from that group of people, maybe they're what you refer to the vested interests, went around the country and went to different places like Illinois, Ohio, California, and Florida. They, he went campaigning and met the industrial leaders of those places or the newspaper publishers and participated in um, knowing the individuals who run the country. And they, in turn, elected him to represent them. But Nixon came to power uh, through several circumstances. And in his book, My Six Crisis, the first crisis, he talks about was the confrontation that Alger Hiss and Whitaker Chambers had, which catapulted Nixon into fame. And that particular incident, uh, I've tried to write about in an article called How Richard Nixon Came to Power, uh, that was the use of planted evidence, which you get in conspiracies that I study very often. In this case, it was the Woodstock typewriter and the microfilm that catapulted Nixon to power. And the second crisis that Nixon had after the Alger his Whitaker Chambers was called the Slush Fund. And he was accused of having more money than any other politician and getting it from somewhere. And the chapter in My Sixth Crisis is very interesting on the sources of money. Where did Nixon get the money? And he made his famous checkers speech. That my wife has a cloth coat, and I just received a dog named Checkers from a man from Texas. He doesn't say the man is Howard Hughes or that Howard Hughes is giving his brother money or uh, where he's getting his money. The point was that while no other man who was running for Congress had the kind of money he had, or vice president, a secret society, a group of men whose names aren't published, a committee of 100 in California, put up the money to start Nixon's campaign fund, and they ran an ad mm -hmm. in the paper uh, 
uh, wanted a man to represent their particular interests. Well, this state grew into a warfare state and a munitions uh, development state, aerospace, and the way he came to power is when he answered this ad, it was simply an advertisement. I have a copy here. It was in August 45 when 100 men in California put an ad. Wanted congressman candidate with no previous political experience to defeat a man who has represented the district for 10 years. Any young man, resident of the district, preferably a veteran, fair education, no political strings. They said no political. But this... Richard Nixon, he didn't apply for the ad. The ad was run out in uh, California. It said applicants will be interviewed by 100 interested citizens, and they're not obligated to the candidate in any way. Well, while that ad was in the paper in California and everyone who applied tur was turned down, uh, Nixon receives a telephone call back east when he's still in the service. Do you want this job? Now, the man from, who? from Mr. Perry, vice president then of the Bank of America. And at that point, then Bank of America just went on to be the largest bank in the world, the largest private bank in the world. And he called Nixon, who was an unknown man. And this committee of 100 brought Nixon to the West Coast and groomed him to run against Voorhees in California. Is he still associated with this committee? Well, they, he's associated with this group, and they changed their faces. And in 1963, after the Kennedy assassination, became known as the, another group called the Lincoln Club. And one of the things that I've worked very hard to try to get people to expose is the list of men behind these organizations, because they fund, they give extra money. Say, if Nixon says, I, I am a Republican, and I'm just like every other Republican running for Congress or for vice president, you know, along with uh, Eisenhower at the time, um, that's what he's saying. It's a fair competition. But at those days, they were spending thousands of dollars, what was 100000 then maybe a million or $10 million today, you know, uh, keeping his name, telev not television, but trips and speaking engagements and press accounts, press releases, keeping his name in the news, sending him around transportation, mailing. Things in the mail. Everyone got letters from Richard Nixon. Well, it cost money for other congressmen for private purposes. This slush fund was keeping him where nobody else was in the news. Not that he was more worthy or more intelligent or doing anything well, more. Well, those things are done today, though, still. Well, he was selected as the man who would be always in the forefront, not on the basis of any particular uh, knowledge or ability, except that he represented the interests of the mach war machine. So he was uh, a front well, I think he was, group, he was uh, a front. Yes, I think he, he, I would say he was a front for this group. He, okay, well, bring, him, bring it to today. Let's well, today, when, when we get to a situation like the conventions this week, Spiro Agnew is nominated. The newspaper, the San Jose Mercury, an article says Spiro Agnew, the unknown. Who's Spiro? Spiro. You call him Spiro or Ted? Know. What I do you call him? Spiro. Spiro, the unknown. Spiro G sometimes when, when I'm really getting. <laughs> well, I call him something else when I'm not on the radio. <laughs> it's Everybody, a, he's supposed to be a household word by now. Spiro? You're, you're, you're saying Spiro. Well, out of spite. Out of spite. <laughs> Just to make sure that he's not a household word in your in your he's not. in your house. No, is it? They describe him as the unknown whose name became synonymous with partisan division, except for the nomination. The Mercury described him that way today. Uh, Margaret Chase Smith said he was a breath of fresh, fresh air and political smog and double talk that goes on, and that four years ago nobody knew who he was, but now he's a household world word. And I think that Spiro, if you call him that, was put upon the American people, uh, foisted there, guaranteed this time the nomination in 76. He represents a handful of people. And with this country... Uh, so many people, well-known, like Rockefeller, and so much wealth in the hands of the Rockefellers, and they've been political all their life, Romney, Percy, and all the other Republicans that were working actively around this country, the Republican Party, are all put aside, and everything is cleared for this man, either if Nixon's killed or if he isn't killed, uh, to follow, to be the successor to this thing. And I think that he is, he is manipulated through a tremendous amount of money and pressure and by, the, who? by the people that want him into power. I think Over that Richard I, Nixon? Well, I think that there's a lot of hardcore conservatives that aren't very happy with Richard Nixon, and they have their well, friends saying... Well, for one, the John Birch Society, they, yeah. they, they, they despise Richard Nixon. There's a hard, long group of people that, that despise him, and his enemies are saying, I just love you, and I've been afraid of, 
of a plot against Nixon for a long time. They've been very sweet to him. They didn't even put up a contest like they used to, like Reagan or Rockefeller for the presidency. They just, or put up any fuzz like for next year. It seems that the deal is made. Let me ask you, you speak of a deal as far as Agnew goes, that he was made the vice presidential nominee this year again Mm -hmm. because uh, the way has been cleared for him to be the presidential nominee in 76 when, of course, Richard Nixon can't run again. Yeah. What does Spiro Agnew have on the administration that puts him in a position to make a deal? It's surely probably one of the easiest things in the world to dump a vice presidential candidate. Well, the one of the things he's got that, that, that I feel is important is that you can't run an election without money. And I think he has unlimited wealth that certain people, oil people, munitions people, the warfare industries. Doesn't Richard Nixon still have that? You say he, he once did or that well, he does now. Well, Richard Nixon once had their support on the condition that he took Agnew as vice president. He didn't have the nomination what is in the some bag magical, last year. Uh, what about the Committee of 100 of the Lincoln Club? Don't they wield the power they used to? Well, maybe they have wielded it behind Agnew that, that they tell Nixon, if you want our support, then you have to take Agnew. See, mm. the condition is you take Agnew. So as long as we don't know the names of those 100, we don't know where they fit into this scene. There shouldn't be such a secret group. We sh- they should be public so we know who decides the president. But obviously, the people on the floor don't decide it. Okay, you say that, that Spiro Agnew, Spiro T, has uh, this enormous amount of uh, potential financial wow. power behind him yeah. and that that has probably enabled him to assure himself a spot as on the presidential ticket in 76. We've also on past shows talked about the $10 million uh, contributed to the Nixon campaign, which was before the April 7th yeah. uh, date after which uh, campaign funds uh, contributions had to be disclosed. Um, and we've, we've wondered on the show where that $10 million came from. Do you think that the $10 million came from, from Agnew backers? Uh, yes. And that- yeah. You see, I definitely do. And we'll go back into the Watergate, you know, for a great part of our show. But all of the people that are involved in the Watergate that have been apprehended are going to be questioned or refused to answer questions so far are all on the Agnew side. They're all the Agnew team. G. Gordon Liddy will go into him, the attorney, you know, for this group, and Howard Hunt. And all of the group that are being apprehended are strong Agnew people, co-founder of Young Americans for Freedom, Charles Colson well, of the White be, House. Before we get into yeah. that, and we're getting starting to get into detail, and we yeah. mentioned the Watergate. Now the ten million funding thing are all Agnew people. Yes. Let's let's move into the Watergate affair, as you've you've called it, and explain what the Watergate okay. is. The, before we do that, let's just wind up the Republican convention with an article that, that okay. pretty well describes it. There were several in the paper this week describing the staging. I guess you saw those articles that came in. Oh, sure. We uh, had some on us probably. Yeah. It Who was, was called the, the uh, it was the programmed convention as opposed to the Democratic Open Convention. Well, yeah, what, one of them was uh, uh, an article, Who's the Real Richard Nixon? The People Feel He's a Robot. And there was one about, uh, oh, they compared it to flushing down a toilet. That was a funny comparison. Joseph Alsop was, this year the voters are going to choose their presence the way they choose plumbing fixtures. Did you see that one? No. The main test of a plumbing fixture was whether it flushes. That was funny because the Watergate affair, they said that, that the men all arrested were part of a White House operation that were called the Plumbers. Uh, that was the co-name of Hunt and Liddy and Colson and, and the group at the Watergate Hill were called the Plumbers. But Alzheimer said a plumbing fixture president is something new in American politics. If you run over it in your mind, all the presidents of the 20th century, you, you can't think of one who got a majority without a drive of wide personal enthusiasm in the electorate. The centuries, major presidents, and also it's very worse, Warren G. Harding have been loved presidents. And then he goes in, not so with Richard Nixon. He's not loved, and they have to push his image. But the one who pushes, they refer to this as the plumbing thing, you know, and the water game, and refer to as the plumbers. Uh, there's been many articles. The stage was set by the man who designed the dating game. And uh, uh, I say... Well, for productions. Uh, yeah, the productions. That I, I, Jack Anderson pointed out that uh, they hired Wolper Productions to present a filmed image of President Nixon because he comes across so poorly live. 
Yeah. So they did a, a production film. Oh, a sideline. A couple of them. Did you see John Wayne's article in the paper this week? He said the, the story about the dikes breaking in Vietnam oh, right. wasn't very bad because they don't build them very well. They were yeah. poorly built. They, they asked him uh, <laughs> where his information was, and he said a small California newspaper printed it a while ago. That they were that poorly a, built. Yeah. That, yeah. Nothing fell on But <laughs> there was one, uh, William Broom from the San Jose Mercury covered the convention fairly well, but he made some pretty good observations in the stagecraft. He talked about the stagecraft of the planning of the th- of the convention and John Ehrlichman saying uh, they didn't want any hostile witnesses. People like McCloskey and everybody were sidetracked. And he doesn't re- speak much, speak very well for the... Uh democratic system does it well here's a remark which is really dangerous by ronald reagan he uh john mitchell uh, had the quotation last year watch what we do not what we say and the article said the conservative dominated rules committee junked virtually every proposal that would give representation representation of blacks youth minorities a quota is a quota is a quota they said at their meetings and here's a quotation from ronald reagan he said we have seen our opponents urge us on Pure democracy, the elimination of the features that made us a republic. <laughs> he says, we don't need a pure democracy, we're a republic. That was Ronald Reagan. And that they, you know, their convention was uh, tied up and uh, they had total control. It, the, the entire convention was controlled. The article by Broom said it was preordained, tightly controlled, operated by script. Even the ministers who gave invocations had to submit their prayers for approval. The Where, con- to, to in the, Miami. To God or the Republican Party? <laughs> oh, let me think about that. Uh, is that the convention was operated like a gigantic trade fair to show off what the first Nixon term had wrought. And uh, the president may have turned the entire convention into a television studio. Well, this is what I mean by his... I not- think pretty everybody assumes that he, that he did. Yeah. But here's a, the conclusion which, which Broom made, which I think is going to come true. Without exception, the delegates that came, come here, came here believe their party is going to win a landslide. But it is doubtful that they have yet grasped that the grand old party may never be the same four years later. You see, they everything is so... They not only couldn't speak up, and they couldn't go to the committees, and they couldn't show dissension, and they couldn't... Mention one other man, like there's one vote from McCloskey on the whole floor. No, two men abstained from uh, Agnew and gave their reasons. But it hardly represents, you say, what's the difference between the old-time political system, you know, and wasn't it always like this? Well, maybe you're too young to remember, but there was some fighting and controversy or preference or, or compromise on the rules and the quotas and things. It's straight uh, what you'd call a right-wing closed system. It doesn't even have to be a convention anymore. I don't know why they went through it. All the vote counting and everything. There really wasn't any reason. Makes you wonder. Yeah. Well, let's... Uh, you, we could go on and on about the convention. and. Well, it, tr- it fits in with the conspiracy thing because I feel that the government was overthrown and that this is no convention and was not going to be a convention or an election. I... You know, it didn't... <laughs> It didn't seem too necessary for the delegates to be there, that's for sure. For sure. It, uh, it had all been decided beforehand, and people could have mailed their their choices in, and it would have turned out the same, I'm sure. But what's worse is they made the decision for 76, too. You see, it's all, Regan will be the vice president, Agnew will be the president. That is all decided, you know, in the event. Either that Nixon's killed, and I think it was very important for them to open this convention by speaking about 76, so then in case anything happens to Nixon, they can say, well, in as much as he's been accepted for 76, there's no problem now. In case people object, say, to Agnew taking over right away or, or feel that. It's already been said. It's been said. What about the Watergate? A lot of it's been said about then. I think uh, that there are moves afoot, not only by the Democrats, but by members of the media, to try and push the Watergate affair into the prominence that many people believe it deserves. Uh, the Watergate Hotel is the uh, national headquarters for the Democratic National Committee. It also, was was the residence of John Mitchell, who is the chairman of the uh, was the chairman of the president's reelection campaign, and it was also the headquarters for the Re- Republican National Committee. And back on June, what was the date? June seventeenth. Seventeenth. Um, I've told me before we went on the air. <laughs> I'm bad with dates. On June seventeenth. Um, 
Five men were caught inside the uh, headquarters of the Democratic National Committee with sophisticated eavesdropping devices and with large sums of money on them. Uh, and they're, they have been tied back to, traced back to the Republican machinery and the White House. And their money has been traced back to the campaign funds for the reelection of the president. There are, are, have been investigations underway by the FBI for what it's worth. Uh, and for by, what it's worth. Well, you've said that, and I'm, I'm trying to summarize. <laughs> yeah. Contending that the FBI may be involved in it, that makes it, you know, as you've said, you suspect the government of being involved, and because the person who is, uh, you have claimed that the White House is involved, and yet the White House has ordered the investigation, and it, the executive branch has ordered uh, a, a group that is uh, tied in with the executive branch to uh, <laughs> conduct the investigation. It's a little suspicious, as you've said in the past. I'm just trying to summarize what you've yeah. said somewhat. So uh, w despite all this and the fact that it's an election year and this is involved in presidential politics and the re-election of the president and his, the challenger, uh, it hasn't received a great deal of publicity aside from the initial splash in the papers and in the, it's on the TV and radio. Well, the articles that, are, that I have, like I have two full notebooks of articles. You don't realize how much is dripping in. But, it's, you know, but it's, certainly it's not the, it's the not Pentagon the, papers by no. any means. No, it hasn't gotten the publicity for... for uh, one reason, for well, for several reasons. First of all, uh, when it broke, nobody knew what to make of it because uh, some very important people were involved. And four days after the Watergate incident, John Mitchell resigned from the committee to reelect the president. So that should be an inkling that something very big was going to follow. And I don't think uh, the media was ready to handle what was taking place. The article that I did for the Realist was the first explanation to be printed in the United States on a motive other than just bugging. And the motive that I suggested in the article was that this is the team, the hidden government, the one that would take over in the event that McGovern is killed and um, would be behind either the killing of McGovern or would kill be behind martial law and killing of Richard Nixon, making Agnew president of the United States. That there are two governments, one visible and one invisible, that Kennedy referred to, and that this is that second team. Well, this is a pretty startling thing to put in a 20-page article. And uh, the men in L.A., we had a press conference, and they were really freaked out, the establishment press, you know. The Washington Post was very anxious for the material. The Washington Star was life and time. And all the major news media have a copy of my article now. But they're moving cautiously, and they're investigating every little question because the article asks more questions than it answers. It throws out a lot of questions. And... I got a call from a, the news department, the Chronicle in San Francisco, and he said, believe me, the news departments are taking it seriously, and they're investigating all the kinds of things that you've suggested to say that there is this hidden team. They've not been able to face conspiracies until now. And as they investigate and get more leads into this thing, it's going to keep making the news and make more news. In the last week, um, it wasn't in the papers up here, but the L.A. Times said that a Mr. Gerstein, a district attorney in Miami, has placed a suit. I don't know if you're aware of it, Phil. Uh, he's told the Justice Department that uh, he's aware of a conspiracy it, that took place because the bank that Bernard Barker, one of the men arrested in Washington, used uh, the controversial bank is in Florida, Miami. And that's the geographical area where Gerstein's a DA. And his suit involves a conspiracy that involves the Watergate, naming prominent Americans that everybody will recognize when he <clears> mentions their names. So he's given it to the Justice Department. Now, they haven't publicly said those names, but he has promised that if the Justice Department holds them back, he will do a suit similar to what Jim Garrison did. Only people are on to it now. You know, they passed off Jim's efforts in 67, but people are on to these things now more, and he says if they slide back that he doesn't care about politics, that he will place this suit because he's more interested in justice. So, uh, and then Senator Proxmire, while the Republican convention was going on, he was on the floor of Congress recommending that, that Congress, the Senate, investigate the Watergate Hotel incident. And he's interested in this second government, this hidden government. And um, it didn't get the news because Nixon got the news all these days. But in the next few weeks, as they delve deeper into the news, it's going to break. Uh, Time magazine had an article uh, this week, which I brought in, on the Watergate issue. Now, they used to call it a caper, 
I'm writing a book calling it The Watergate Affair, so that you'll think of it like the perfume affair that rocked England. It will be the Watergate Affair if this is the hidden government, the secret government. And time made some interesting discoveries, which have to do, for those of you that listened to my radio shows before, this is going to sound familiar. They said that the Watergate forces were planning to plant incendiary bombs in the hall during the Democratic Convention or conspire to have the hall stormed by paid Cuban mercenaries. Now, you know, when we talked about Squad 19 and Lewis Tackwood saying that at the conventions, that he was talking about particularly the Republican conventions, that there would be paid provocateurs that would kill people inside the buildings and outside, and the exile, he didn't say the exile Cubans, he said the provocateurs would create a situation that would require martial law. People disbelieved, even at the press conference in L.A., people disbelieved that killings are planned, the violence is planned, that you sacrifice bodies on the street in order to get law and order, like Hitler did. We saw what Hitler did, and it worked, and, and people don't want to admit that, but yet I understand that, that uh, the car across the street from the Watergate that one of the men used, the Chrysler, was filled with arsenal and weapons and this type of thing. But now time has to, they're doing research on this, and they have to have some background to say these men were planning incendiary bombs and planning violence. See, so that's just one little bit. You can imagine how much more there are. So uh, now this establishment newspaper is saying it. This isn't coming some radical underground that people say, well, where did you get that source of information? The researchers on time and all, as they investigate. My story on the Watergate, I think you're going to see more and more of similarities to what I'm saying coming out. Because this, the, he said, uh, the incident has given the Democrats ammunition they couldn't have imagined, the whole water great story. Time has a large article. It says, as the cops moved in, the Justice Department officials learned of recording equipment in the Howard Johnson Motel across the street. Now, I got a call just this week from somebody back east in New York who went to the Watergate Hotel, and he does computer work and electronic work, and they were glad to show him the headquarters that were bugged in the ceiling. And he also was able to inspect or see the Howard Johnson Motel, and because of the wiring setups of that, he, he figured it was very difficult because you don't use direct wiring to pick up what was being said at the Watergate. But from the offices that were bugged by that window directly to John Mitchell's apartment, there was an open space where messages could be carried directly. And I wrote, again, in the story in The Realist on Martha Mitchell, uh, why she's a prisoner. She said she saw dirty things, and she lives at the Watergate Hotel. So the message I got you know, from this person who does computer and electronic work was your speculation about did Martha see any of the men who were bugging or did the messages go to their place? could possibly turn out to be... People are working on all these leads and checking mm -hmm. them out, see? And uh, so the, the, I think you'll see more in the news. Uh, here was another important thing that was in Time magazine. Well, this is where they referred to the plumbers. It said this intelligence crew that was involved in the Watergate team, the so-called plumbers, was originally recruited by the administration to investigate leaks to the media. Now, Richard Nixon was being embarrassed because things said at the National Security Council about India and Pakistan were linked to the news. Now, no one in the Democratic headquarters got those links. Jack Anderson got them, but this is the cover for the group being formed. You see, this isn't why they were really formed. I still think it's that hidden government. They said it was to check news leaks to the media. They included G. Gordon Liddy, the former White House staffer, Robert Mardian, the former assistant U.S. attorney. Mardian was the one involved in the ITT who was pressing for a tougher uh, decision, you know, and then he backed out and resigned and was appointed a judge somewhere. Mardian was in on this and Howard Hunt of the Watergate. And they go into a man, time goes into the name of a man, Manuel de Guerre, Manuel O'Guerre de Guerre of Mexico who had the $89,000 that ended up in Miami at the account of Bernard Barker. And uh, so this money had gone from the Republican committee, now it's been discovered, the 89000 to Mexico, to Manuel de Guerre, to um, Miami. And if these men were just doing surveillance and not double espionage, the kind where you overthrow the country or 
uh, save money for assassinations, like whether it's for shooting Wallace at time or shooting uh, McGovern if you have to, or Nixon if you have to. You can't send a direct check. It has to lose its course as many times over. This has to so be. This went through Mexico. This went from the committee to Mexico. Well, the the man who has that account at Mexico. One of his clients is Gulf Resources and Chemical Corporation of Houston, Texas. And Robert Allen, the president of that corporation, is the chairman of the Texas Committee to Re-elect Richard Nixon. Now, mm -hmm. what all this means uh, is very complicated for people who haven't followed the entire case. But in summary, um, I've contended that, that James McCord, one of the men arrested uh, at the time of the Watergate Hotel, who was a paid employee of the committee to re-elect Richard Nixon, has strong contacts in Houston. The agency that, that was hired to have protection for the convention in my okay. I want to talk a little bit about the Sirhan family today and also about the doctor that got in the archives to see the Kennedy x-rays, because that's really a historic first, but we'll why we the, have we dispensed with the Watergate then? Well, there's a, a few things that, that are important about the Watergate. It's hard to dispense with it because there's so much in the news. Well, I just meant for the week. Uh, well, I think the important thing this week to keep, a lot of people may wonder what's so important about setting up bugging devices or what if they were snooping. You know, it's a federal crime or it's a crime in the District of Columbia. But beyond that, uh, why is it such an issue? Why is it going to make the news? Why is it going to be out more? Why did McGovern say two weeks ago that everywhere I go, everywhere I speak, I'm going to be speaking about the Watergate Hotel? Um, I think the reason he's saying that is that deep down in uh, McGovern's mind and certain people's minds, this is going to be the most important story in the United States. And it isn't just a question of getting secrets or conversation on other persons. If they scrape this case open, you'll see the inner workings of that second government, that hidden government. The agents that were involved, the men were arrested, were all involved in the CIA, with the CIA for many years, lawyers for the CIA, writer for the CIA, and uh, plannings, the Bay of Pigs uh, invasion. All these, the men arrested, the five that were arrested at the Watergate Hotel, June 17th, were involved in the Bay of Pigs operation, which was such a disgraced the United States and the worst thing the CIA had done. And yet, 11 years later, the same men as a team are working to do something to the electoral process uh, in 1972. And it couldn't just be gathering information. I What was it then? Well, I, my conspiratorial view of history is, is that it involved overthrowing the government, blaming a, a a certain amount of violence on radicals and taking martial law. And the Democratic Party? Uh, the actual purpose of having the equipment in the Democratic Party headquarters. It well, they could have planted evidence. In, so they could have planted the devices in there that took conversation and then sent people in who are registered Democrats who are sitting in the office talking about how they're going to kill Nixon. Just like they have a tape recording in Miami of a man saying how, exactly how Kennedy was going to be killed three weeks later. You take a high-powered scope. So you think the man was why, involved. He's why would it have to be within Democratic Party headquarters? If they, they wanted to have a tape of of uh, Democrats, uh, registered Democrats, talking about killing the President of the United States, uh, they could make that tape anywhere and say it was recorded there. Well, because they could be seen removing some, something. They could say, well, these tapes came or somebody took them out. They found out the place was bugged and, here, oh, here's these tapes. What do they have on them? I think they could plant information that would make it look like the Democrats were involved in the murder. And because every one of these other murders, political assassinations, has been so well concealed and made it look like the other side, starting with Oswald, who they said was a communist, who never had anything to do with communists. And there was so much stuff planned. There were magazines in his garage and subscriptions that started coming after he was dead to the Daily Worker and things that he didn't even know about when he was alive or didn't even see. Well, why did they bother having all this stuff available so that as soon as he was dead, they rounded it all up and said, look, he's a communist. See, uh, even oh, just in October before the assassination, he called a man in Houston and said the man's name he traced to a magazine subscription, the worker, the socialist that came to his mailbox. And Oswald found out the man's name who had taken care of the subscription. He says, why did you do that? Somebody had told the man to get a subscription for Oswald, send it to his box. And Oswald was furious on the way to Mexico. 
he calls this man's wife, you know, the man merchant seaman who was away, and he said, why did he send that stuff to my box? What is it? You see, he was beginning to receive this left of center literature, and he didn't even know what it was about. And, and after he was dead, then Postmaster Holmes said, oh, there's nothing in his box but this daily worker. Then at the house where he lived at Michael and Ruth Payne, they said, well, oh, he got these magazines, but I didn't open them. Well, Michael Payne had security clearance and designed helicopters at Bel Aerospace, and they uh, would certainly know if there's communist literature coming to the house. And the garage then was supposed to be full of it. Never fingerprinted to see if Oswald held it. So you go to great lengths to plant stuff. There was an application for him to the Civil Liberties Union, and uh, he had never been to a meeting or anything that was found in New York, never check the fingerprint or handwriting to see if somebody else sent in the application for him so they could bring in all these organizations after he's dead. So you could have people in the Democratic headquarters uh, making conversations and later come across a well-routine thing and find these tapes. Oh, this is who did it. See, I, I think that it, they could easily plant this stuff like they planted it in Oswald. You know, um, you mentioned before about the... Uh the audit of the uh, campaign funds. Oh, the books. Of course, yeah. the, the audit has came about, I think, after the Watergate. And it was when the uh, question arose where the money came from. And it was pointed out that it, some of it had been traced back to the re-election fund. Yes, because uh, in addition to looking into that $89,000 that Bernard Barker had in Miami, and he was the conduit of funds for the Bay of Pigs invasion, he was holding $89,000 from that Mexican bank that he checked out in $100 bills shortly before the Watergate affair. He also had a deposit there for $25,000. So they wanted to find out where that came from. And that w came directly from the committee to reelect the president in Washington. It didn't go to Mexico first. But it was handed to Marie Stans, former Secretary of Commerce. And uh, there's an article in the paper this week, Thursday, that the GOPs are blocking the audit report. That a la It said a last-minute... Uh, Telephone, please stop release for the moment of a federal investigation of the Republican campaign of a phone call from who? It doesn't say. The General Accounting Office, oh, it says final plea from Marie Stan, Secretary of Commerce and President Nixon's chief fundraiser. And they flew down, the investigators flew to Miami Beach with the report while the convention was going on. And it says Washington newspapers have already printed stories saying the report is highly critical of handling the Republican funds. Now, this goes back to the beginning of the program of Nixon, the secret agent, the slush funds. Uh, he has this secret $10 million. Now they've come across extra money, and uh, uh, the, the, they're supposed to reveal the source of that money. And they are now they've they've opened up the office, and just for, since April 7th, because the first $10 million was secret. And they have found a large amount of money. There's 500000 that they reported right away that of the Nixon money that they said was mishandled, but there was 100,000 campaign security money from which 25,000 was taken into the bank account. There was 200,000 in unreported expenditures. There was another 100,000 in campaign security. This is uh, from Barb, Bob Woodward, the LA Times, and uh, they, it said an examination of the court papers reveals that a federal prosecutor told the attorney G. Gordon Liddy who was a White House aide and the former attorney for the Nixon committee, that the jury has enough evidence for a felony indictment against Liddy. <laughs> so so why isn't... <laughs> that's a fairly unbelievable... I'm looking at this, yeah. this story here, Read which is uh, from the Mercury uh, Washington Bureau, San Jose Mercury. I don't know how people can sit there <laughs> with the... You know, the investigation is of the Republican Party, and here the Republican Party, uh, a, a Republican member of the Nixon cabinet has blocked the release of the report and well, I don't know how people can sit there and possibly defend something like that. Well, this, I'm speaking you, now as a commentator, not a newsman and as a citizen, but yeah. it sounds very suspicious. Well, as a citizen, Phil, uh, how do you feel? Uh, I'm reading the story of this attorney up in San Jose this week who's being tried for murder. He shot that young fellow, you know, who was a, he thought was a trespasser and he murdered him. And they were doing some ballistics and they tried to show that the bullets recovered didn't match the gun that he had, you know. Here's a man in San Jose who isn't well known, who's defending himself on ballistics evidence. And when you think that they didn't even do that with the Robert Kennedy or the Martin Luther King murder or the John Kennedy match, the bullets. I'm I'm reading the testimony of criminalists in San Jose and and when they get away with actual murder cases where they don't use the bullets and things, then they block it on the murder of 
a civil rights leader, a president, a senator. This is what I've cried all along. They, yeah. I've seen them block this. You know, uh, we've done this show, you know, maybe for six months, and I talk endlessly about that. Why aren't the citizens outraged at the blocking of the handling of criminal evidence? Where a man goes to, to isolate to prison, like James Ray, who's isolated, or Sirhan, these people are isolated on the evidence that doesn't even line up that they did the murders. Well, now, we're now you're talking about fun. Yeah, now, they're blocking. So. Now, I'm just I'm speaking just now from a uh, personal personal comment, and for people listening yeah. now, they can they can uh, discard it as being just personal uh, opinion. But in my personal opinion, when we're talking about these things, some of some of the evidence which is not followed up, some of the uh, interference which is reported, it's in the paper for people to read. Here, the headline in the Mercury, the, the <laughs> Grand Old Party Blocks the Campaign Audit Report. <laughs> Grand and Old it, Party. And it, it, well, from a personal, just from a personal standpoint, I think, and from what I've found since I've been in, in the news business, is that the, uh, the American public as a whole has an unswerving loyalty to the presidency and to the government. And the real danger, again, I'm speaking from personal opinion, is to the government is those who do not question that blind faith that uh, <laughs> the blind faith of people that that the American flag is is always flying in the right direction. Uh, that is the danger. It's the people who don't question. It's the people who accept everything at at face value as it's written out for them uh, that are really the greatest danger to, to the country. Well, this is this is what the program is all about, really, isn't it? Well, I've I been think questioning so. for 10 years, and we have an opportunity on the radio to to show how the system, like week after week, I talk about the way things are covered up or handled. People don't question. And here they say they block it. it what is worse, it says a series, uh, well, a series of resignations came from the committee after the grand jury began investigating. Now, that means there has to be some guilt. These men are, are resigning like there's no tomorrow. I have a list here of the men who've stepped down, been fired, and are going to be investigated left their jobs. I mean, from John Mitchell on down, you know, this is set, the attorney, former attorney general. It says the general accounting office said it will release the report shortly. It is a financial investigation arm of the federal government, and it goes down and asks Maurice Stans what he thinks. And he's the involved federal, in the re-election. Re he's a Nixon administration member, cabinet member. Yeah, a, it, it just raises, it just... Uh, Smells wrong. Yeah, that, I mean, even if there's nothing to it, it smells wrong, and for that reason alone, people should be, should be questioning. That's the thing. Is I again, we've we've issued or I've issued this challenge many times. There are those people who listen to a dialogue conspiracy once, and they hear some of these far out conclusions and some some incredible questions asked. And uh, w with you sitting here now, I'll say, May, that everything you say isn't true. I'm sure, but everything uh, one person says is never true. But you ask questions. And you ask for answers that or oftentimes that, are delivered months or years later. And they're not, at least you're asking, but nobody is challenging you. I ask these questions, and none of them, in this way, I'm not saying they're all true. What You've I been say. wrong before. I mean, things you have said have turned out differently, or they appear to have been turn, uh, turned out differently. Well, what if I say there's going to be provocations at the, the convention, and then two weeks later, earlier, the men are locked up? Uh, that was unforeseen, that, that this would, bloodshed would stop. I've been wrong on that kind of thing because we didn't get the bloodiness that we would have gotten if those men hadn't, uh, they were hiring uh, provocateurs, okay. and, and that kind of thing. But what I'm saying is that you yeah. have asked questions. What you have done is, is really not that much more than a person with the same resources and taking the, the enormous amount of time that you've taken could do themselves. I mean, yeah. you, you've poured over a, a newspaper and magazine articles. You have phoned people, written letters by the dozen uh, but you have you're not using secret evidence here. What you're simply doing is is trapping people in their own inconsistencies oh, yes. yeah. by seeing uh, what they say on one day, what they say on the next day. And if a person is lying, they inevitably get caught up in those lies. But but again, what I've said before is that for people listening now who hear this, uh, who are I would hope some are loyal Nixon supporters or loyal uh, Republicans, that that they listen to this and if they can't. If they can't refute it, or if they can't explain why this is 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 all right, then they should s start questioning. Well, there's an article. Everybody should yeah. question. The Washington Post had an article this week uh, says state GOP charge is bungling and the showdown with the Nixon aides. It said angry Republican state chairman. 
today demand a showdown with the White House officials. Now, you see, this is why I say Nixon isn't a Republican. They're simply furious, all the Republicans, see, because Nixon is controlled by the Central Intelligence Agency and the funding of this secret government, that secret 10 million, and the things that have put Nixon into power all of his life are not part of the mainstream Republican Party. And the wiretapping issue in Miami came up, and there, this article says there were complaints from every segment of the Republican Party. They, and even Dole from Kansas said, what we've got to do is find out who's in charge. Is it Haldeman of the White House? Who is running that place? And it's a, this is an article about dissatisfaction with Marie Stans, the financial chairman, money not going out to the Republican Party, people running for office, and they want to know what is happening. Uh, one lighthearted moment, it said uh, Dole said he didn't know why anyone would wa- be interested in wiretapping the Democratic Committee. He said, in my office, I have a case of Pepsi-Cola, old posters, and two busts of Eisenhower. And they want to know what's going on, why these men are doing this, what caused them the embarrassment, who was doing all this. See, they can't figure out what what they wanted or why they were there. But they pretty well admit that there is a Republican Party tie-in. Oh, yes, but there's a book I'm just reading now by Whalen called Catch a Falling Flag, and it's about the Republican Party. He was in the Republican Party always and feels that the Republicans are left out of the scene and that Nixon is controlled by this inner circle of Haldeman and Ehrlichman and that team and that they can't get to him and that the government is falling apart because of this secret group. And I think this whole team of secret men that was arrested or connected to the Watergate is that extreme right-wing group, the behind-the-scene group, the same kind that secretly put Hitler into power and then appeared. Uh, There was another article that fits in with the research that I've done and what Tackwood said that said GOP aid says the funds were used to study radicals. Now, I said in the article in The Realist, we'll give the address, too, before we go off the air. If you want to subscribe or you can come in the station and pick up a copy, you can tell them about that, Phil. But this has to do with the Tackwood allegations about radicals and uh, coming down on radicals having martial law and Nixon taking full control of the government. Uh, Members of the campaign staff of Nixon are saying that G. Gordon Liddy, again, and this team were studying radicals. Well, James McCourt was on an emergency contingency group to study radicals. You see that? The state of California studied radicals uh, here on the station. We have an article based on a California Council on Criminal Justice study of the radicals in the uh, colleges and universities of California. It was a specific California study. Yeah, but this study was, was in quotes to study radicals. You know the plan was to hire radicals and get provocateurs going, you know, and then come down with violence and... Uh, uh, I don't know if you read anything. This of, GOP aide says this was to study the radicals. Yeah, Gordon but, and you're, Liddy. you're saying that the plan was to hire the radicals. Well, that's what Squad 19 was yes, about. Yes, that's right. Uh, according to. Uh, well, this is what the G- G- Tackwood says. Tackwood's article. Because uh-huh. the GOP aide said that Gordon Liddy was working with uh, radicals what to do, this is a quote, if the crazies made an attack on the president. Gordon Liddy was worked in the White House with Howard Hunt, and he was the attorney for the Finance Committee. And w- these men that that had the explosives, the, the Time Man magazine talks about that were going to do provocations, violence down there in Miami. W- they were all related together, and the Emergency Contingency Unit of Squad 19 that uh, James McCord belonged to, uh, it's discussed in the Washington Post again that they were to find out what to do with the crazies if they attack the president. Now, that takes care of the radicals, and it takes care of the president. And again, you end up with Agnew. You see, what's surfacing is that Watergate keeps going on, as you are going to find, that this group are the work, the work of the CIA that tie in with the past political assassinations. And do you think that they actually, um, you've said on past programs and today also, that... Squad 19 was involved in hiring people to uh, cause trouble at the convention, that the Watergate people uh, had money in the bank that would be used for that purpose, supplying arms and weapons and paying people off. Uh, First of all, there's a two-part question. First, do you think that the uh, discovery of these five men within the Democratic headquarters halted any further work on that? And second, do you think 
that the trouble this week at the convention, although it was smaller, may have been instigated by some of the people who had already been paid off and had already had their plans delivered to them, and that they represented only a portion of those who would have yeah. been to work had the Watergate not occurred? Yeah, well, uh, I could answer that. I brought in some articles about the news clippings of the mass arrest this week, and the one of the people they mentioned uh, was Senator James Buckley, was escorted in the hall after he was surrounded by people who shouted, murder, murder. Well, Buckley was the one who w recommended Howard Hunt to the White House, you know, and Hunt was the man who two men that arrested the Watergate had his name. Hunt has been sought for. He was questioned by the FBI after the arrest. He is either out of the country or hasn't been seen since June. The men that were mentioned in the newspaper this week in terms of violence at the convention were three men directly involved with the Watergate affair. One was Carlos Prio Sequeiros, the former Cuban president. The other was Reverend Carl McIntyre. One was Buckley. Carl McIntyre is a liaison between Charles Colson. I'm throwing out names here, but I want to show that the, the link of the Watergate Hotel to the provocateurs appeared in our news this week, the very people that they were quoting. Okay, explain how. Were, well, Charles... Explain how McIntyre... Well, the, the, behind the Watergate, if these four men were the ones that were going to hire the paid provocateurs, they had close friends. The two men at the Watergate Hotel had the name of Howard Hunt. Okay. Hunt was hired, supposedly, by Charles Colson in the White House. Col Hunt was 21 years with the CIA, had a desk in the White House with the walkie-talkies and the gun at the time of his arrest. But Colson works with the CIA. He was firmly with the OSS, and he's the liaison of the extreme right wing to the White House. He brought Carl McIntyre to Washington for the pro-Vietnam marches. He works with Premier Key. He works with Agnew. He is the very right-wing liaison member of the White House that reaches Richard Nixon. What is his upfront job, his it, public job? A consultant to the White House. And he is the liaison who makes the arrangements. He made him for Key to come here and speak, and that was canceled. He had he arranged for Carl McIntyre. So here is Colson's friend McIntyre giving a press interview at the time. Uh, the scuffles down there that were quoted in the press were with James Buckley, Carlos Prio Sequeira, and Carl McIntyre. Now, those three men had direct links to Watergate men, and they were quoted in the news as having scuffles with provocateurs. And well, I, were these provocateurs? You say they these are, are from provocateurs, the, yeah. and they were told specifically to... Well, these weren't pro provocateurs that lined up with the team to make a scene of what it's like, you know, what the scuffling young ruffians around the country. Then it's very coincidental that the people who chose to attack were these three men. That has to be really a wild coincidence that all the instances that were quoted over our wire service, over the AP service here, were, were just happened to bump into the men mentioned in the Watergate thing. Well, you haven't really answered my question, yeah. although the question about do you think that that the fact that the Watergate occurred uh, meant, that only, meant that there were some people who had been paid off in a had had arrangements made of what they were to do and the fact that uh, the Watergate kind of blew that, that there were some that yeah. couldn't be there stopped. There would be thousands of more, yet there would have been a lot of killings, there would have been that, violence. That's your contention. Abs my contention is that, that lives were saved by the hundreds. Well, even Time Magazine talking about the ammunition that their intent was to bomb. You don't bomb, what do you bomb? There were going to be people inside those buildings, you know. And uh, my contention is that, that lives were saved at the Democratic Convention and the Republican Convention because uh, the paid provocateurs were there, the plans had to be called off, the plans were exposed publicly. I know that the, the copy that we got out of The Realist was sent uh, right early in August, the first, last week of July, about the first of August, all the newspaper people, a lot of people in Washington had copies. And if you're writing a blueprint of how it's going to happen, uh, most of it has to be called off. They couldn't possibly do it that way. They may do it another time, another place. But if you blueprint, that's one reason we wanted to get the article out. Uh, we, covered, yeah. we covered a lot of ground, and uh, we're, we've run out of time. I, should, I was going to say yeah. we're running out, but we've run out of time. We should <laughs> mention The Realist. Last week we mentioned that there would be copies of The Realist available here at the station, and we ran out. Uh, people were, came down right after the program, even though we said we weren't open. There's some here now. We have, we've got some more copies in, and if you can afford the 50 cents, uh, somebody's got to pay for these copies. And <laughs> May is paying for them right now out of her pocket. 
And so if you can afford the 50 or cents... Paul Krasner. Or Paul Krasner, the, uh, the publisher. Uh, if you can afford the 50 cents, come on by and pick up a copy. Please uh, come by Monday, if at all possible. Um, the, a subscription is uh, $3 a year to The Realist and the uh, Conspiracy Newsers. Newsletter. Uh, which will be when's it coming out, May? As soon as I sit down and write it. As soon as she sits down and write it, that's uh, six dollars to subscribe. It's twice a month. But uh, those who would like to read the articles on how Richard Nixon came to power and the real meaning of the Watergate, uh, as well as all the other usual material that you find in the Realist, come by and pick up. It's the uh, August '72 issue of the Realist. It'll be here at the station. And they can subscribe. A lot of people, last week somebody asked the address. Do you have time okay. to give it? The uh, address is the Realist, Department 93, Box 379, Stuyvesant Station, New York, New York, 10009. I'll read it once again. We, I think we have time for that. It's the Realist, Department 93, Box 379, Stuyvesant Station, S-T-U-Y-V-E-S-A-N-T Station, New York, New York, 10009. So there you go. Okay. That's the dialogue conspiracy for this Saturday, and we're out of town. Time, we're also going to be out of town now, <laughs> and uh, we'll be back next week, uh, God willing, and Spiro. Well, I'd like to tell you about a new feature that the station.